Dobře. Hello. Please welcome our next speaker, Langdon White from Red Hat, who will be talking about rethinking Linux distributions. Hi, I'm Langdon. In case you couldn't figure out who was speaking, uh, and if I can actually change slides. Um, so I'm Langdon. Oh, goodness, not cut off. Uh, I'm Langdon. Um, I was an evangelist for RHEL, um, and uh, although we call them advocates now. Um, so, uh, but now I'm platform architect and developer experience. Um, my running joke is that uh, they got tired of me complaining, so they said, okay, now you have to go to engineering and fix stuff. Uh, I think they're still waiting for that. Um, and I've been working on Fedora modularity, which is kind of loosely related to uh, the ring stuff as well. Uh, this is Thomas. He plays a lot of uh, football, I think you call it here, and uh, basketball. Does lots of homework, and uh, as my joking tweet said earlier, uh, he uses Instagram to talk to his friends. Uh, they post a picture on Instagram, and then they use the comments to chat. The picture has nothing to do with the conversation. <laughs> and apparently it is a mechanism by which they can avoid uh, parents monitoring what they're talking about. Um, which I just thought I was fascinated. Um, and you know, between that and Snapchat, I'm like, you know, I'm gonna stick with Twitter. I know I'm old, but you know, come on. Um, so starting off, distributions are awesome, you know? Just like that dinosaur. They, they are, they're always awesome. Um, so, but kind of the point of why is it a Lego dinosaur? Well, because it's actually, you know, a whole bunch of pieces, right, fit together uh, to create something, right? And the thing they create is really, really cool. However, that whole thing has to move together all the time, right? Otherwise, it all falls apart. And that's not so good, right? And uh, I will say it was not my idea to include the dinosaur. Originally, I just thought it was hilarious. Um, all right, so what we're doing here today is we're going to talk basically about some of the motivations um, around like kind of what's been going on in the software industry and why um, maybe Linux distributions aren't the right answer uh, for all the world's problems anymore, at least the way they're constructed today. And so to start off with, um, the biggest, uh, the single biggest thing I think that's the driver here is that we've really, really started to recognize that operating systems, application frameworks, and applications themselves have different life cycles. And distributions, almost by definition, disallow that disconnection, right? And in a sense, that's actually what's good about them, right? Is that you could always update uh, any application as a sysadmin uh, anytime you wanted, because if there was a critical CVE or whatever, you didn't have to worry about the vendor, right? You didn't have to rely on the vendor to ship uh, the appropriate patch at the appropriate time. And as a sysadmin, you could update it underneath them. So that's the first step, or the first thing. Uh, the next thing is, you know, how we do software has also changed a lot in the last 20 years, right? You know, roughly speaking, that's about how long distributions have been around, um, or certainly at least they've gotten popular. Um, and so we do things like uh, Agile, right? So, and actually this is my, my example around Agile and DevOps I think are interesting. In the mid 90s, um, when you were a developer, that meant you also could replace a hard drive. It meant you could also fix a server, right? Because developers were basically all there was. We didn't really have the striation we have now of all these different types of developers, right? Or sysadmins, or UX designers, or any of that stuff. It was just all the same people. And all the user experience stuff showed it. Um, so what happened in kind of the late 90s, everybody started to separate that stuff out. And we started to have specialists, right? And as one CFO, actually, I worked for once, uh, used to say, it's like, we took the entire steel industry over 200 years and decided to do the same exact thing, except in 40, right? So we're basically going through all these maturation processes that every other industry has gone through, except like with medicine, which took several thousand years, we decided to do it since the 60s, right? And so we separated all these people out, and then we said, oh, crap, right? 
We just found out that when it's not all in one person's head, it doesn't work so well. So what we did was we said, hey, maybe we could actually get the guys who do the requirements to come and talk to us instead of it just being something that they ship over a wall. And we call that agile, right? Then a little bit later on, we said, oh, you know, if there's these people who operate the actual applications we run, why don't we invite them too? And we could call that DevOps, right? Uh, then the other thing that's been crazy, right, is the amount of data buildup. Um, I used to know the stat off the top of my head, but it's like, it's like petabytes every year or something. It's, it's just insane. And so now we have an entire subject field, right, around data analysis, right? Another whole new thing. You've got all these, uh, uh, you know, these software systems that use streaming data as a way to trigger events. I mean, it's just everything about software is so different now than it was 20 years ago. And then my favorite part, right, is the pendulum has swung back towards the developers. So now the developers are in charge. And as a developer, that's awesome. As a sysadmin, that is terrible. Right? So what, what's been, basically what's been going on is um, we kind of, like everything else, right? Everything is always on a spectrum. And there's a pendulum that goes back and forth about kind of who's in control. Um, and so in, again, kind of the late 90s, mostly it was developers who were in control. As a result, it was very difficult to manage systems, it was very difficult to manage applications, etc. Then kind of in the early 2000s, the sysadmins kind of took over the control, the pendulum swung back towards them. Um, and everyone became very concerned about updatability of systems, uh, about the resili resilience and reliability of systems, way more so than the applications themselves. Okay? So, but then that's kind of started to swing back the other way. And my goal with some of this talk and the work I've been doing is to not let it swing all the way back, right? Is why don't we actually help developers not be idiots, okay? Um, because I know I'm an idiot. I don't really understand the concept of DevOps. Like why in God's name would I not want to just throw my application over the wall and let somebody else get woken up at two in the morning? Um, but I understand from a quality and a use perspective, uh, yeah, DevOps is probably a better choice. But, so this is a great book, if you haven't read it, uh, by Steve O'Grady, who works for a, uh, an analyst firm that actually specifically focuses on developers. Um, then the next thing we've also started to realize is that different user scenarios have different risks. Oh, by the way, if you couldn't tell from my personality, feel free to you know, shout out questions, raise your hand, would probably be slightly more polite, but don't wait till the end. Um, so different user scenarios have different risks. So in other words, when I'm deploying an ERP, right, that runs my entire business, it costs me millions of dollars to implement, you know what I would like to do? Never ever touch it again, right? Now on the flip side, you take something like a movie, you know, a movie website, right? So a movie's about to come out and they put up a marketing website and it's going to go away very quickly, right? It's probably very static. There's just not that much risk involved if it gets destroyed, right? You can replace it pretty easily. And it doesn't really matter that much. It doesn't have that much lifespan. Why do we want to keep those things at the same level of quality? Okay? There may be a particular argument for my particular example, but the point being, different applications can have different levels of quality that's required, different levels of reliability. Um, I actually worked at, a, I worked at a big financial firm a long time ago, and one of the best things they did is they had this grid right, that said, you know, reliability kind of along this way, you know, and, uh, you know, uptime kind of this way. I can't remember what the X and Y axis were exactly. But basically, if you were out here, it was like, you know, 37 nines of uptime, right? And if you were down here, it was like, if you were lucky, it was up, right? And what they actually did was charge the business to be over here. And so the business had to actually make a determination that said where they were on that spectrum. And if they were over here, it was like, well, you know what, your budget is you know, a million dollars a year right now, you need 10 just to run this app, right? So it, they would drive them back into the realm of sanity without actually having to explain what you know, 37 nines of uptime means to somebody. All right, so one of the things that is of particular annoyance to developers, usually, is that sysadmins update their applications in production. Why is this a problem? Well, this is a problem because, and this is also kind of the point, they do not have bug-for-bug -bug compatibility, okay? Because you're putting in a CVE fix, that doesn't mean I didn't notice that there was a bug that had a security flaw that I might have written a workaround for. So the sysadmin who introduces that new patch might actually be introducing a security bug, right? 
So you have this, we have this entire fragile set of things, right? Fragile in the sense that things are very, you know, well stacked up. And actually, that's what the picture is over here, right? It's, uh, is this is a particular kind of rock that actually um, like it gets cracked and the entire basically surface falls down. Um, but the point being is that you know we, we talk about standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Uh, like as a software developer now, we're standing on the shoulders of skyscrapers. Okay, I mean it just the, the millions of lines of code underneath your application. The last thing you want to do is touch anything in there without actually essentially running all your tests again, right? So this is some of the popularity around containers uh, because it's so easy to, as a developer, to defend my application from the updates coming in from uh, you know, the sysadmin side, right? Now on the flip side, they also do a nice thing of well, containerizing, but containerizing um, what is exposed, right? So you can still do a firewall update, assuming you know, my app doesn't touch firewalls, um, and it doesn't actually have any chance of affecting my application, even if they both use the same SSL library, right? Well, it's not a great example, but you get the idea. Um, so that's the last, the last kind of problem I was talking about. So then a few years ago, just checking how I'm doing on time here. A few years ago, uh, Matthew Miller, um, through you know, mostly him as a presenter, um, and he, he claims that there were a lot of people involved in the concept. I think that was mostly to avoid getting hurt, um, but proposed this kind of rings concept. So what does the rings concept do? Well, it says, okay, why don't we start to think about how do we separate the applications from the frameworks from the actual core of the OS, right? So instead of being a distribution, where we actually have an operating system, and then we have applications that run on top of it. And then where we can, we share pieces between applications, and that's what we call frameworks, right? So the next thing we did was we released the Fedora editions, okay? And this was kind of the first step towards this path. So there's a shared library of RPMs, essentially, that you can choose to use in any of the editions. So we have you know, three different editions, and with different use cases, which means, you know, to some extent, that on the workstation one, for example, we have the shorter lifecycle components, right? Because as a desktop user, it's much better to be using kind of much more current things uh, and updating it regularly. The, the system itself is usually less at risk, you know, except for things like conferences and stuff, but whatever. Um, you know, I don't recommend going to DEF CON with your own phone. Um, the server, you want to solidify. Right? You want it to like, be able to age over time. So you want to choose kind of a little more carefully that you want to use uh, you know, an older set of packages, perhaps. Right? And you want to make uh, choices that are less risky. Um, cloud is actually really interesting because it's kind of both. But at the same time, you want to be able to choose for that use case the individual applications you want to do. Um, for example, you know, like cloud doesn't have a firewall. right? which seems really, really odd on any other kind of server because you don't need a firewall when you're deployed in something like EC2 because you have firewall service coming from somewhere else, in theory. But. <laughs> All right, so then um, what we kind of decided to do was kind of, okay, so we've established essentially kind of the, the first idea of, of ring separation by doing the additions. So then we kind of jumped to the next easiest thing, which is let's take a look at the outermost ring. Okay, so applications that are of dubious quality. And by dubious, I don't necessarily mean it with the normal interpretation of negative, but dubious in the sense that we really have no idea what kind of quality they are. They may be awesome, but they're not, we don't know. And we don't have the time or the energy to review them quickly enough for people to want them to be available. So that's when we introduced this copper thing, which is apparently proven to be very popular amongst most people. Um, and it does a couple of nice things, right? So this is how I got uh, LibreOffice 5, for example, on Fedora 22, um, because it wasn't available yet for uh, Fedora. So that kind of gives me the cutting edge stuff. But then on the flip side, for a long time, I was using system config LVM when they took it away from Fedora because I can't figure out LVM, so I, I, I like the little graphical interface. Um, and so I would just pull SRPMs out of Koji and just rebuild it for whatever version of Fedora I was on. 
so it kind of lets you do both things, right? So I can do a net new application that we don't know if it's good yet or not, or I can do an older application that's probably riddled with security holes, um, but I can choose to run it, right? It's my choice, it's my application, it's my risk, right? And because it's my laptop, I know, you know, I know enough about my laptop to know whether it's a, I can quantify that risk, right? So that's one of the nice things about copper. One of the things that was proposed but never actually got passed, at least not yet, was to try to start to think about the next ring in from the outermost. Again, being kind of the simplest thing to do, um, which was the playground proposal, which is the idea that some set of the copper repos uh, will be of high enough quality that we want to give some sort of attribution for it, right? Some, you know, attest to it as Fedora that it is of some level of quality. It's not as good quality as all the stuff that's in the main repos, but it's definitely uh, been, somebody's taken a look at it, okay? And so that was kind of the next idea there. Then we also had uh, a proposal called the ALIF proposal, which actually tried to define five rings, okay? And basically with ALIF zero, if, if you guys are familiar with ALIF, uh, it means it comes from math. And so the set of, the set of integers is uh, ALIF zero, and like the set of ordinal numbers is ALIF one, and so it's basically, it's different sets of, of numbers. Um, so same kind of idea here, right? The set of RPMs that is the most core is ALIF zero, and then essentially ALIF five is kind of all the way out in that, that outermost ring. So that was kind of the next idea. Also, it didn't get passed, but it, uh, it was close. Um, yeah. And then, basically, a lot of things got stuck. And my interpretation of the big reason why a lot of those things got stuck is because of the rings proposal, is that the metaphor falls apart because we have lots and lots of orthogonal concerns around um, the quality of a package, okay? So at first, with the rings proposal, right, everything fits neatly in a ring and it looks pretty and it's really easy to understand, however, Let's take, for example, build dependencies, okay? So if you want to build something, um, you need to have the build dependencies. Does, do the build dependencies belong in the same ring as the application that they build? Do they need to be maintained at the same level of quality as the things that they build? Not necessarily. As long as they do their job correctly, uh, that's fine. They could be packaged terribly. Right? Because they don't have to be the same. They don't have to be the same quality. Okay, so what do you do with that? Well, so does it go in the ring, but it's somehow marked as yucky? You know, we don't, we don't really want that. So I did all kinds of cool diagrams that all worked out terribly um, with bubbles and Venn diagrams and a bunch of other things, and it just got worse and worse. Uh, if you were at one of the talks earlier today, um, they showed another of Matt Miller's uh, pictures, which was the rings, but then with like a bunch of drugs in it. Um, and, uh, you know, so it just, it really, really falls apart. And the orthogonal concerns, right, so the metrics by which you want to rate the quality of something um, are uh, wide reaching, as we know already. And then on top of that, we don't even know what we don't know yet. Sorry, is there a question? Well, let's put it this way. I don't know. And the point I kind of am trying to make here is that we want flexibility in the decision around kind of, I hate to say every given package, but every given package, right? We want to be able to have a flexibility that if there's a use case for something to fall in or out of a ring or whatever, or being varying levels of quality, that the system we're designing supports that. And then, so that was, the, that was the first problem. The other problem is uh, developers still won't do it because it has the word RPM in it, right? So pretty much by definition, they won't do it. So there's lots of reasons why developers don't really like RPMs, but I would argue that whether RPM is the best uh, way to package things or not, the fact that as a developer who does Python or Ruby or Java or whatever, every six months when I want to do a release, every three months when I want to do a release, uh, I need to relearn this esoteric language that I don't use for anything else, 
right? This is the same reason I hate HTTPD virtual hosts, right? It's like every time I want to start a new web development project, I have to go figure out Apache again, right? I don't do it often enough to actually learn it, right? I just learn it well enough to accomplish that one goal, and then I run away and go back to the stuff I do every day, and then I come back three or six months later, and oh my god, I have to learn it all again, right? So even if it was easier to learn, it doesn't really help that much, right? Because you have to jump out and come back all the time. And so my little picture here is, you know, we want to do simple packaging, right? We don't want them to have to go and custom touch everything, make nice boxes. Um, and the example here was actually from an article, which was kind of interesting, that that kind of packaging is like 15 euro um, per box versus uh, kind of the more generic boxes you get, which is like, uh, like 50 cents, right? So like half a euro, right? Um, well, we're done, right? Like that, that's all you guys came for, right? Was just, yeah, we're. So, modularity. So the idea here is that what we want to start to do is think about these things in terms of larger blobs, right? And by blob, I don't necessarily mean anything negative. Again, you know, this isn't necessarily about bundling or not bundling or any of that kind of thing. As much as that we want to start to think about applications as applications, okay, rather than as a set of packages. And the reason we want to do that is because we want them to be defended from other applications, okay? So the advantage of shared RPMs between different applications um, you know, there's some advantage in disk space, right? There's some advantage in knowing where one thing is and updating just that one thing. However, the disadvantage is basically all the stuff I just went through, right? So how can we figure out a way to um, actually guarantee an application its own defensibility and, it, and the application can have some level of expectation around when it decides whether it wants to share or not share? Okay, so that's kind of one aspect. What I'd really like to see, and this may or may not be something we can pull off, is I would actually like the OS to be able to decide whether or not it gets a new copy of something or if it gets one that already exists. Because when you ask for a library, there is somebody who knows whether or not it's already there, and that's the OS itself. Why we rely on human packagers to figure out whether or not something is there or whether it, it's built or whatever, when we could just have the application, when it's talking to the OS to get those libraries, it could just go get them itself, right? I, I'm crazy, just to be clear. Um, the other part is, and, and uh, there's a, a project going on with Fedora minimization, right? Um, a lot of people look at that as uh, there is some sort of intrinsic value into small disk size. I don't care. I don't understand why anybody cares, okay? As far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, half a gig or a gig of, you know, whatever for a server is irrelevant, okay? I, I, don't even, I, I don't even know of a server, right, that actually is that small. So it just doesn't matter. The reason it matters, okay, is for attack surface area, okay? However, one of the interesting things that's a byproduct, uh, and I think uh, Stephen Tweedy brought this up in a meeting I was in the other day, it's like all the localization libraries are one of the things we keep trying to remove in kind of concepts like Fedora minimization. Localization library, or local, sorry, translations, actually, not libraries, but like the actual translations themselves, they're not providing an attack surface, guys. They don't execute, right? It doesn't, you know, sort of. Um, but, but people want to take it out anyway, right? Because they want to get it as small as possible. But so there's the attack surface argument, which does make sense, okay? But it do, still doesn't really drive the minimization down as much as I, as I think we need. What does drive the minimization down is to minimize the amount of overlap between dependencies between different things. So we need not only a minimization around core, which is kind of the obvious one that people are focused on for, you know, like container-based images, you know, or a minimal install or those kinds of things, but we also need to do it around applications. Right? So when we start to talk about modules and applications, then we need a way to minimize their dependencies on all other applications. And in a sense, uh, minimize its, its dependency on the OS itself. Right? So the, the number of libraries that are considered part of the application, is the higher number that is, is better. That doesn't necessarily mean that the, um, it doesn't share components when it's actually like on disk, 
but it does mean that conceptually the operating system can complete, continue to change as much as it wants as the application stays the same, right? So the more libraries we push up into the application itself, the more flexibility we have in the OS, right? So, you know, one of the classic problems, right, there's is Fedora 14, right? You know, everybody and their brother was still running Fedora 14 for a really long time until Fedora 21 came out. I don't know, Matt's got all these in his slides, but I can never remember. So, but the point being is that why did they stay there, right? Is it because they thought everything about Fedora 14 was awesome um, and that there was no need for any advancement in computers again? I, I'm guessing no, right? My guess is that the applications that they used on that OS were what they liked and they wanted those versions, right? For whatever reason. So as a result, they had to stay with that version of the operating system, right? We don't need that. We don't need to keep them so tightly connected. All right, and then the last thing is that we need a way to provide application developers uh, a way to ship their applications, right? So my little bag here, right? So we want to give them a bag that they can shove all their stuff in and then ship it to their customers and customers, users, right? Whatever. Um, and we want that bag to look a lot like the bag they're already using, okay? If not exactly the same. And what that means, though, is that we lose one of the major advantages that we have with RPM. And, um, you know, I don't know, I'm old, right? So that's a card catalog, it's called. Uh, and it's a way you find books in libraries, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, so, but the idea being, there's all this metadata we still need to ship to the users, right? We need to be able to tell them all these quality metrics about the application they want to use. But we need to give them a separate channel for that content, for the metadata content, that's distinct from the application itself. But we also need to be able to say, this metadata element uh, is attached to this particular binary, right? So that's not any fun. That's why RPM was invented. So let's break that and do something completely different just to make things more fun. So basically, the combination of these kind of three concepts is really what we're trying to do uh, with kind of modularization or, you know, re uh, with like Fedora Next or Rings 2 or whatever you want to call it. But basically, this is what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to meet the problems from the beginning in a way that will not only um, protect the sysadmins, right, but also help the developers to be able to ship their applications more easily. So where are we now? Um, so these are some examples of applications that are starting to go down this route, okay, or applications or concepts or whatever, um, initiatives, let's say. So Rollkit, for example, um, is this idea of we need a way to provide an application and a way to install it that is generic so that a consumer can know how to install what roles, right, um, and not have to know the intricate, ver you know, concepts that are going on with something like an RPM install. So in other words, when you RPM install something, there's only one way it can be installed, right? Um, generally speaking in the RPM world. What this tries to do is say, you know what, when you're initially installing certain kinds of applications, you want a level of interaction that you uh, can engage with. And, but not all the time, right? You don't always want to be able to update it. You may have a golden version that then you don't want to have to uh, kind of manually install every time. So it's trying to take kind of a balance between those two things. Then you have XDG app. XDG app is uh, containerization technology. But what it's trying to do, which uh, I think they don't focus on enough, um, is that they're providing essentially a, um, a platform that you can write your application against that is separate and distinct from the OS. So XTG app will say, and it's mostly focused on uh, desktop applications for, for GNOME, um, but it'll say you have your container, right? But then you have GTK3 and I, uh, you know, of some version, right? Some even, potentially even down to the Z version. So as an application author, I can target that particular version. And when I'm ready, I can upgrade to the latest version as an application developer. So they're providing an application platform layer that is completely independent from what's running on the rest of the machine, okay? So that the application can have a different life cycle, in this case from GNOME, sort of, but also from the OS itself. 
Um, however, it's actually not limited to GTK. Like you could put other application frameworks in there. Um, they just happen to be biased towards that because they're GNOME guys. Um, Atomic Workstation is kind of the underpinnings of that same concept. So if you have all of your applications delivered as these containers, then you can um, have an actual, like then your OS can maybe operate completely differently than um, the applications themselves. And so the idea is that it's an immutable um, operating system that then you can put applications on top of. How could you, you couldn't really do that with RPM the way it works today. Uh, so that's kind of why they're talking about the containerization side of it. Nulecule and Atomic App are an attempt to say, hey, you know what? Most applications do not just have one container specifically, but they're not just one app most of the time, right? If you want to do a website, right, you need at a minimum, you need a web server and a database, almost always, right? So how do you coordinate those two things together, right? So most applications are actually multi-component. So we need a way to describe them and we need a way to create them and we need a way to deploy them where we treat them as if they're an autonomous unit, right? Sounds kind of like the modules things I was talking about. The base working group was working on, or is working on um, uh, how to identify that center ring, um, which I think is kind of a very, very difficult thing to actually get anyone to ever agree on. So I kind of tend to like the idea better of, why don't we just start pulling all the applications out? And then whatever we end up with at the end is the ring, right? That's the center, rather than trying to figure out the center first, um, because everyone will have their own opinions. Um, Another change that's come in is, these, is weak dependencies. And so this allows us, even with RPM, to start to modularize things, right? It starts to say, you know what? You don't have to provide this particular dependency. And then the Environments and Stacks Working Group, they're the ones who produ produce uh, the kind of guidelines and stuff for Copper, uh, as well as the proposal for Playground and the proposal for Aleph. So in, in the ENS Working Group is where a lot of this stuff should be taking place and where the kind of definitions should be taking place, even if the, um, the implementations are taking place in individual projects. So there's still lots more to do. Um, oh, wait. I needed to update more of my slides than I realized. <laughs> um, I gave a very similar talk at FOSDEM last week. Um, so, but I did plug DevConf, so everybody should be happy about that. Um, and uh, there's also, you know, we're starting to see, uh, you know, we're starting to have this developer.fedoraproject.org, right? Which is targeted at application developers, right? The people we want to attract to Fedora, right? We want to attract more application developers as users and contributors to Fedora because as that pendulum swings over, we want more and more of them to come start participating, especially as we start to see things like DevOps where there are fewer and fewer sysadmins in the traditional sense, right? Very soon, sysadmins will be, man if they're not already, managing thousands of machines, right? Ton tons and tons and tons of machines where, you know, it used to be, you know, one guy managed maybe 100 at the high side. You can't do that anymore. You're now managing hundreds, if not thousands of machines. We need better tools to enable them to do that. But more interestingly, the future of distributions, it's really important. We need to attract the people who are actually going to be doing software stuff uh, much more than we are today because in, the, in this future space, right, we won't need uh, to support operating systems directly per se, right? I mean, it'll be much more managed and it'll be about the applications and the OS will be a providing, uh, just providing enough information to make those applications run. Um, and then, let's see, uh, we'd love you to come participate in the Environments and Stacks Working Group, uh, you know, in any of the apps I mentioned, uh, there's more of those coming along. Um, more documentation about how to kind of get plugged into this uh, is starting and uh, we'd like to see you there. And uh, I'm, I'm giving myself a deadline for an update on all of this at Flock in August. Um, and uh, so I hope to see you all there, or uh, at least you can watch the talk over streaming video. Um, that's pretty much all I've got. Are there uh, questions? Oh, and sorry, and if, once the slides are up, uh, there's links to basically everything I mentioned in here. So, sorry, go ahead.
Xbox Live. Uh, am I doing something wrong? Yeah, Xbox Live. Uh, thank you. If uh, there are apps in the system that uh, depend on the same library but uh, another version of it, uh, isn't it going to create a huge mess? Uh, at least how I understand it. So, can, can you define mess? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, ten versions of the same library. Uh, no, uh, ten different versions of the same library on the same system. Right. What's wrong with that? Well, configuration file formats may change, and uh, maybe let's just look at uh, GTK themes. They break from one version to another, so. Uh, okay, so this is an argument I get a lot, so <laughs> that's why I'm I'm trolling you a bit. Um, the uh, <laughs> so uh, as as people who use computers every day, right? Um, we have certain expectations around how they operate. Um, so that our muscle memory works correctly, right? Um, a whole bunch of why people hated GNOME 3 is because their muscle memory stopped working, right? Um, there may be lots of other reasons, but that's definitely one of them. Um, uh, the exact same ha thing happened with Microsoft Office, right? When they moved to the ribbon model, right? Was it's, it's not so much that the ribbon thing was a bad idea as much as their, uh, people's muscle memory stopped working. A uh, great example of that, too, uh, I worked with a woman who, uh, who worked on a project that's, that cost a, like a million dollars, give or take, um, and uh, to replace an old terminal system, uh, sorry, like a, a mainframe system with a web app, right? And their users hated it, hated it, because all of those super fast things that they had memorized over the last 20 years that they could do on a mainframe in seconds, now they had to click around on a website. Right? Talk about actually maybe talking to the users first, right? So one of the expectations we have, uh, particularly sysadmins, is that I know in my head where certain kinds of files are. That's one of the arguments about the mess, right? So if the files are littered all over the place, how will I ever find them, right? Um, that's one. Another example is, as you said, like configuration, right? For that particular version, maybe that changes over time. So they actually have to have different configs to go with different libraries. And who knows, maybe it's a whole stack of things that have to, have to be different. I argue, number one, because I really don't understand the fascination with disk space, that to some extent, as far as disk space is concerned, who cares? Um, but number two, one argument you can definitely see is what about RAM, right? Okay, well, that starts to be a better argument in my mind. But you know, the last part about the, your muscle memory remembers where it is, you know, we have a computer. It's really good at keeping track of stuff. How about we just make it so that the computer presents to the user where they expect it to be, rather than making the user remember? Because that's what computers do, right? So can we change how some of the operating system works, or the file systems work, or how they look, at least, to the user, so that all that muscle memory still works, but it's a lie? And you know what? File systems, for a long time now, have been lying like crazy, right? Like, if you know anything about what's actually going on in a hard disk, when you try to write a file, you will keep all of your notes under your pillow, okay? Handwritten in multiple copies, right? Very much like if you've ever worked at a bank, you really, really have to convince yourself to put money back in there, right? Go ahead. What about security updates if you have 10 copies of, li of some library used by several of right. those installed applications? Split? So. So two things. One, and I didn't really mention this earlier, um, but one thing that is uh, significantly more true today than it was 20 years ago is um, you can much more regularly trust your vendors. Okay, Matt would disagree. He hates all vendors, um, but you can much more regularly trust your vendors. A lot of the vendors, right, are open source projects. Distribution. What? We trust Fedora. Right. Right. Um, so. You can trust your distribution, right? Part of the reason distributions are there is because you couldn't trust vendors, right? Is that you wanted an independent way to get those security patches down. So this is where I'm saying is like, let's keep the pendulum from going the whole other way, okay? So if pure straight up containerization continues, um, it doesn't matter what you want as a sysadmin, you will not be able to patch it, right? So what I would argue is that um, instead, if we can allow an application to have different versions of different libraries, you know, yeah, barring some of the other problems that we have with it, as far as like security is concerned, well, you can actually decide to um, 
take the, the module, right? Take the application as it gets updated. The other thing is that if we have a knowledge of those modules or those applications kind of in the Fedora infrastructure, the second the CVE comes out, right, it starts the testing and the trigger a build and everything else. It's not like, um, it's not like it was, again, like 20 years ago, where you basically have to wait for them to ship you a CD or something, right? Like we can actually know about those applications, particularly with the open source world, in the actual Fedora infrastructure. So just because there was a CVE that came out against a particular patch, or against a particular library, doesn't mean we can't just as quickly get the resolution for all the individual applications. Oh, and by the way, they'll actually have been tested too, right? Versus just blindly updating the library. Does that make sense? I didn't explain that terribly well, but I'm stressing out because he's yelling at me out of time. <laughs> uh, are there any, is there anything else or um, do we have one more or not? I don't know what time it is. Okay, yeah, go ahead, shoot. Do, do you know about uh, other Linux distributions if they are trying to solve similar problems with modularity and so on? Um, sort of. Um, I don't know any other distributions that are trying to solve the problem from the perspective that I'm taking with it. Um, I think all of the distributions have this problem and do various things to try to solve it, but kind of for different means or with, or with different goals, right? So Nix, I think, is a great example, right? Or Packager, right? Um, like, but I'm not sure the motivations are the same. Um, so they may not end up with a result we could use. Uh, but I hope, like, I, I mean, I think this is the future, right? You know, the, the popularity of things like containerization, you know, how do things actually get run in the real world? One VM per application. Every single RPM in the stack for that application is rebuilt by the, by the person who's running it. Why? Because they don't want any updates, right? They don't want to affect that application without it being under control. Why does the sysadmin sit down and look at the 20 CVEs that came out last night? because he only wants to pick the ones that he thinks applies. But how does he know? Shouldn't he be able to just blindly say yum update and magic happens, right? This is kind of the point. We do all of these workarounds in the real world to avoid the fact that we're using a distribution. So that's my argument.